on your Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party What's up, party people in the place to be? My name is Talib Kweli, the BKMC, the MCEO, the Gentleman Savage, and some other monikers that I'm not even going to get into right now. This is the People's Party. I'm rocking out with Jasmine Lee. Give it up to Jasmine Lee, my co-host. Yeah. Everybody in the house. Shout out to Jasmine Lee. Now, Jasmine, um, you're from Roosevelt, Long Island. Yes, I am. And you moved to Hollywood. Hollywood. To try to make it out here as an actor and a comedian yes. in Hollywood. How's that been going so far? It's been going great. I'm in all of your favorite shows. <laughs> Drinking a sip of water. <laughs> <laughs> For everybody who is working hard and aspiring to be an actor, a writer, a director, this episode right here is a must watch for you. Mm -hmm. This episode is about black excellence. It's truly the story of black excellence because this guest is a writer, he's a producer, he's a director. He has produced on things as wide ranging as the Bernie Mac show, mm -hmm. the Django Unchained, Bay Bay's Kids, the Boondocks. Um, as a director, he's worked on things like Black Monday, The Last OG, which I was on in the last episode, and I got to work with this gentleman on that, uh, The Office, to movies that have defined the culture. Mm -hmm. House Party, Boomerang. People's Party is proud to welcome Reggie Hudlin. Yeah. Oh, he's standing up for this. Yes, 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 yes. What's up, bro? So good, man. So good. How are you? I'm fantastic. So happy to be on the show. We're Thank happy you to for have you. gracing us with your presence. Well, first off, let me start with uh, one love to Angela Nissel. Yes. Because if it wasn't for Angela, I would not have met you. Right, because Angela said, oh, Talib should be in this episode yeah. that I wrote. Yes. 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 And we got to meet on set. I mean, again, that was such a fantastic show. Yeah. And look, I've known Tracy for a long time, from when he was um, on at the Uptown Comedy Club. Mm -hmm. You know, again, in that 90s... Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 90s, I remember... His his headshot had a beanie with a propeller on it. What? Yeah, right? I remember that. That was Uptown Comedy Club, and he had it, had it on NBC for a second. Exactly. Yeah. So I remember seeing him there, going, "Man, this guy's incredible!" Mm -hmm. And just to see his journey. Mm -hmm. And you know, the thing about Tracy is that it it looks crazy, mm -hmm. but the fact is he's a precision guy. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so we're all working together mm -hmm. and then boom, you walk on set. I'm like, ah, oh, this is so <laughs> great. I get to work with one of my heroes. Oh man, a hero, and oh, brother. So then we just get to hang out for a whole week having a great time. Yeah, man, shout out to Method Man and um, Alan Maldonado. Yes. And, um, and I got to meet Anna Marie Horsford. And, um, you know, Tracy just, it was a tribute to Brooklyn. That show, whole show is a tribute to Brooklyn, but the mm -hmm. episode I was on was a tribute to Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, right. which was an extra layer of, of freshness for me. It, was, it was all spectacular. There you are in the in the, in the the uh, Samuel Jackson Jr. role, mm -hmm. you know, wake up. It was just so much fun. It was an amazing crew, mm -hmm. amazing cast, amazing squad of writers. Uh, my man Saladin Patterson yeah, heading yeah. it up. Uh, Angela, uh, you know, Dia, and mm -hmm. an amazing, I mean, the executive from the network, mm -hmm. this beautiful sister, it was an amazing moment. Yeah. And I mean, I've been through enough moments when you know this is an amazing mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And I was like, okay, we're all here now. We'll all remember this. Right. Because this is special. Right. Well, shout out to Tracy Morgan, Tiffany Haddish. Man. That show yes. is, is incredible. I yes. auditioned for that show. It was my first uh Big audition as a SAG. Okay. I, I didn't make it because I didn't meet you. But. <laughs> <laughs> but here I am now. I still watch the show. I still love it. And the point is, you auditioned. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? It's all about at-bats. Getting in the room. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, the greatest baseball player, he misses more hits than he makes. Mm -hmm. Right. You bat 300, do doing well. I'm saying. Yeah. So it's just, you know, nine times down, ten times up. Yeah. What you going to do when you get punched in the face? That's get right. back up and punch him back. That's all, right. all I'm saying. Everybody, See, that's a winner's attitude. Everybody has a plan so they get punched in the face. Everyone has a plan. <laughs> that's Mike Tyson right there. Mike, the genius Mike Tyson. Yeah, the genius. Um, now, you and your brother Warrington Hudlin uh, are great-great-grandsons of Peter and Nancy Hudlin, 
who helped with the Underground Railroad? Yes, sir. Oh, break that wow. down. So my uncle Richard Hutland mm-hmm. started e- examining our family tree, and he just dis- he discovered many amazing um, members who preceded us. Okay, and one of them was Peter Hutland, who was a conductor on the Underground Railroad uh, in St. Louis. In St. Louis, Illinois. Well, or no, he was in St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. And, you know, that's basically the first big city after you cross the Mason-Dixon line, mm-hmm. right? So, so you know, you would come across, boom, he had you mm-hmm. in a basement mm-hmm. and then would move you on to wherever you needed to go next. Okay. So, I mean, but even further back than Peter, there were these three Helton brothers on a plantation in Virginia and one ended up in St. Louis. Okay. And the weird thing is you got these three brothers on a plantation in Virginia. So me and my two brothers grew up on a street named Virginia place in East St. Louis. Mm. East St. Louis. Yes. Which is in Illinois. Right. So it's just, I wanted it, to be, so the people didn't think I was losing my Cause there's two mind. different places. No, yeah. no, no. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. St. Louis, Missouri, East right. St. Louis, Illinois. Right. It's almost like Manhattan to Brooklyn. Right. Mm. You know, like same city, but different okay. slight differences in personality and geography. Okay. But related Okay. You know, connected by the river. Okay, got it. Who in your family uh, was in charge of passing down these stories? Like, had to, for you to have such rich family history and be able to tell everyone else about it? Well, that's the thing. Information gets lost and found and lost and found. So, no, it, it didn't come down continuously. Like, one of the craziest thing that happened to me and my brother once we started our film career is this film historian reached out to us and said hey, here's something about your family you may not know. Oh, wow. Which was, there was another Richard Hutland at the turn of the uh, the 20th century, so like 1910, 1914, mm-hmm. who lived in St. Louis, and he was a filmmaker. And he was a Shakespearean actor mm-hmm. who then started making movies. And when you listen to his motivations... If you take his quotes and take the word Negro out and put black in, it could be me and my brother talking. Wow. 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 And we didn't know that. That information got lost. Right. But the point is, but the the instinct got passed on. So your brother Warrington went to Yale. You went to Harvard. Mm-hmm. Um, why was it important for black men at that time to prove that they could excel at these traditional halls? Um, and... Do you have an opinion on people like Jamel Hill who say like black athletes and people who are are representing that black excellence should go to, you know, HBCUs? It's not an either or. Okay. It's not a zero sum game. Right. Um, What's the goal? Excellence. Right. And there's many platforms to have that excellence. Right. So going to HBCUs and supporting HBCUs Mm -hmm. is great. Going to Ivy League schools is great. You know, now I've got kids. My daughter's 15. Mm -hmm. We're talking about colleges. Mm -hmm. She may go to Harvard. She may go to Howard. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It'll be her choice with, you know, me weighing in heavily. (laughs) (laughs) Both great schools, though. But, yeah, they're all Mm -hmm. great schools. And, you know, you... What I've learned now as a parent mm-hmm. is you have to look at each child and go, what do you need? Mm-hmm. It's not about me projecting my ambitions on you mm-hmm. or some cookie cutter program mm-hmm. like, oh, your big brother or sister went there, so that's where you're going. Right. It's about what's the custom fitted suit of each person's life mm-hmm. and what do they need? The custom fitted suit of each person's life. How did you get, well, they should definitely go to Howard or FAMU, but, you know, that's just my (laughs) opinion. Uh, How did you get from Illinois to Hollywood? Well, I just wanted to make movies. That's a thing I was always wanted to do. I always wanted to tell stories. Mm -hmm. So um, I was, and I was always telling my brother, Warrington, my ideas for movies. Mm -hmm. So finally one Christmas, uh, you know, he gives me a present. I open it up and inside is a book. And all the pages are blank. Oh, wow. And he says, stop telling me your stories and write them down. Mm. Now, let me just stop and say, for everyone who has ambitions in storytelling, Mm -hmm. in whatever medium you might be, Mm -hmm. step one is to stop telling people and writing them down. Mm. Because so many people call me, I got a great idea for a movie. I just need you to write it down. 
Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. You know how to write. Just right. start writing it down. But I don't know the rules. You don't need to know the rules. You just need to start writing down your ideas. I can't have a, I don't have a whole story in my head. Well, if you write down the part you know, mm-hmm. and you'll figure out the missing parts and you'll fill those in. A lot right. of times when you're successful at a craft, um, people will come to you and be like, yo, I got a great idea. You'd be like, what's your idea? And they'd be like, so I was going to reach out to you. And that's the start of the idea is that they want you to do something. Yes. You know, and when the start of your idea is you want someone else to do something, that's not really a great idea at all. Mm-hmm. That's not really it. And you can't be intimidated by the part you don't know. Mm-hmm. That just means that's the part you have to learn. Right. Don't be scared of learning. Right. Like, you know. Right. So, so anyway, so I started writing down my ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, so by the time I was applying to college, I knew I wanted to make movies. Mm-hmm. So I started studying film in college so it got time to make my senior thesis film. Uh, that summer, I wrote a script called House Party. Mm-hmm. So I did this 20-minute short film called House Party, wow. uh, which was basically like a shrunken version of what eventually became my first feature film, mm-hmm. House Party. Um, now, you and your brother directed and came up with this commercial the Hey Love commercial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my brother does this commercial called Hey Love, and now if for you, people who are who are not black um, <laughs> or of a certain age, yeah, you know, it is an age thing, but it's also a black thing. Yeah, you know, um, it's a commercial that is advertising uh, where you back in the days before you could just grab songs out of sh- the thin air with Shazam, you'd have to like wait till TV was about to go off, and then it'd be commercials for old songs. Remember this old song? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would be a you know a compilation of your favorite slow one, jams, right? And yeah. this was a compilation of the greatest slow jams in the world, mm-hmm. right? Like Hey Love, all the classics of the '60s, '70s, mm-hmm. all on one album. And if you have taste at all, you want this album because yes. it's incredible, right? And we were lucky enough to do the commercial for it, and the the commercial had a tagline that went viral before there was viral, a viral. right? <laughs> Uh, which is, no, my brother, you got to get your own. You got to get your own. <laughs> and um, when that commercial went viral, and then you were able to put that commercial in the movie House Party. Yes. That must have been an awesome feeling. Well, what was crazy... It was what, like a character in the movie. It was... Uh, first of all, they, they use it in Say Anything, mm-hmm. right? Uh, um, so right. we were like, yo, they... Put our thing in the movie. Right. <laughs> so that was exciting. Right. Just to get love, you know, right. uh, from, a, you know, someone working in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And then when we met the filmmaker and the star, they were like, oh, we love that commercial. Mm-hmm. So so we were like, yo, let's just gas our own thing up. Yeah, so, right. yeah, put it in the movie because why not? Right. I mean, it, it was already a part of the culture. So mm-hmm. it wasn't like we were imposing something. Mm-hmm. We were just acknowledging the reality that we did this little 30-second thing that had an impact. Right. Now, House Party... Um, it's significant for many, many, many reasons, but it was a huge platform, maybe the biggest platform in the film world for a rapper at the time. Uh, y'all started out directing rap videos yeah. um, with Heavy D. Yep. Um, talk to me about the legacy of Dwight, Heavy D, um, and what he meant to the culture, because I don't think he really gets his due props. Oh, of course not, mm-hmm. because... Well, this is this is just so much fun, man. I love it. Yeah, we're, we're, we're having a blast. We're yeah. having a blast. That's what we're trying to do. This was like it was on set. Yeah, there's no one going. Oh, I don't have to go back to set. I don't have to set up the next shot. This right, is just great. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, um, I, I was showing some of my short films at the Newark Film Festival, mm-hmm. which is the oldest black film festival in the country. Mm-hmm. So, Andre Harrell was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, who founded Uptown Records. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Yes, sir. <laughs> Wall Street rap. Right. AM, PM, right. all night long. <laughs> so Shout out to Andre. Andre was like, hey, mm-hmm. we're going you know, to make movies together. Mm-hmm. I was like, great. But I'm thinking, well, you say that. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, I know he's going to make music videos, so... Mm-hmm. Let's go for the money we're sure he could get. Right. So we're like, well, let's do some videos together. Well, of course. Right. <laughs> so I love your Andre Harrell. Well, of course. <laughs> I love Andre. I love when people do voices here, period. Right. It's amazing. So he was doing two videos, right? Mm-hmm. So it was two videos for $50,000, mm-hmm. 
which was a lot of money for us. We're like, wow, right. $50,000. Right. So my brother directed one, which was Uptown's Kicking It, which was Uptown's everyone Kicking on, It. Yeah, yeah. Everybody on the label was in that video. Uptown, Uptown. And then the other video was <laughs> Mr. Big Stuff right. with Heavy D. Right. So my brother was going to do the Uptown video, and mm-hmm. I was going to do the one with Hef. Mm-hmm. So I had to do a meeting with Heavy. Mm-hmm. So he lived... I, we lived in Harlem. We were on 149th and mm-hmm. Broadway. So I had to get up t- to Heavy. Mm-hmm. So I took two subway trains and then a bus. Mm-hmm. And then they met me at the bus station and they drove me to his house. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he had a real classic black people house. I'm trying to remember there was plastic on the- it's Mount Vernon. Oh, yeah, on the couch? Mount, yes. Of course. Yeah. I'm there sure There may it was. or may not have been plastic. I can't recall exactly, but- it was psychically there if it was not literally yeah, yeah, yeah. there, right? And they he had the Hey Love album. Mm. <laughs> of course. And they were like, yo, this of is course. the jam. When they said you did this commercial, you right. knew you could do this. Right. <laughs> so it's like, great. Word up. So we start talking about the video. And, you know, so we just got into all kinds of conversations. Like, okay, what's the choreography going to be? Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know. Have good dance. Oh, Heavens was was a beast. Yeah. And, you know, Trouble T. Trouble Roy T. Roy and all those guys. Yeah, rest in peace. Uh, rest in peace. So I was like, look, you know, you might want to consider what the Temptations and all these other brothers did. You know, they did choreographic moves that were metaphorical. Mm-hmm. You know, so they were like, oh, you mean like when, you know, when he talks about being the king, so they would become a stool and yeah, then he yeah, would think, yeah. you yeah, know, so it's just like, you know, so it's like, look, that way you're not just doing the hot dance for five minutes. Right. You can, you know, you can build this thing out. So it was just great, you know, being on the ground floor of what was clearly going to be a big thing mm-hmm. because Andre had an, an incredible eye for talent. Hev was clearly an amazing talent, mm. you know, funny, charming. Uh, so the video became a hit. Uh, the uptowns, I mean, everything kind of blew up. Mm-hmm. And it was just one of those things where, you know, it's like going to high school together. Yeah. You know, you, you come up from the beginning together. Yeah. And that and that connection will never die. Yeah. Right? So then 20 plus years later, you know, I'm putting my kids in grade school here in Los Angeles. Who Who's at that school? Have with his daughter. Yeah. And it's like, yo, look at us. Mm-hmm. We're grown as men. Yeah. With kids in, in the school. same school, you know, here in L.A., yeah. And, you know, we would just see each other on drop off. Mm. You know, we're talking and, you know, he's doing his thing. He's acting. He's doing all kinds of stuff. And we start talking about this project we were doing together. He sent me this script he wrote and we we're working on it. Mm-hmm. And I was calling again. I'm like, where's Hev? Mm-hmm. And it was like, he's gone. Yeah. Uh. And it was just this incredible heartbreak. Yeah. Because to know him is to love him. Yeah, man. I worked with him a little bit. Right, right up into that moment, um, mm-hmm. and the music he was working on at that time, a lot of it I've, I haven't heard since he passed. But <sighs> Hev was a huge loss. Yeah, huge he was loss. Amazing and, talent. and you know, and I think one of the reasons why he's underrated is because, <laughs> you know, um, that category of hip hop gets dismissed by people. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a great episode of Bernie Mac when mm-hmm. he was Which telling you produced on. Yes, when yes. I produced and directed on. One of my favorite on. shows. Thank you. And he talked about, you know, his music and how the kids can't touch his, you know, his mm-hmm. CDs. And he goes, you know, that's my jazz, that's my soul, that's mm-hmm. my happy rap. And it was like, <laughs> happy rap. Happy that's what rap. it was. <laughs> that's heavy. Happy yeah. rap. There's nothing wrong with happy right. rap. No. Everyone's trying to be so hard, mm-hmm. right? right? And obviously, it, you know, NWA had this giant global impact and uh-huh. there was all this money to be made from. And it was great. Obviously, you know, what Dre and Cuba mm-hmm. and all those get was revolutionary. Mm-hmm. But it's it's I think it's an easy thing for all Americans Mm -hmm. to dismiss things that are fun. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, well, fun's easy and fun. And that's not fun. Isn't as deep as Mm. heavy and hard and dark. Mm. So no, 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 no. Fun's underrated. Right. You know, happy is just as difficult to execute as dark and edgy. Right. It's crazy because I don't, I I guess I didn't think heavy D was underrated because I loved heavy D. Like that was one of like, we watched him on the regular basis. And when you just said that, I'm like, wow, he, I guess he is. Yeah, he is. I think his name is not brought for, for his, it's not, he wasn't just an artist that rapped and sang and danced. Um, His impact in terms of his 
what he what he set up for Uptown. Yes. And you know what he set up for Puff. Mm-hmm. You know, and his, his connections were like like there is no Mary J. Blige Uptown, Puff Daddy, mm-hmm. none of that. Just none of that without Heavy D. And it's like um, you know, his Jamaican roots and how he was able to influence the culture. Him being a big dude and moving the way he did. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, like him being a lyricist, him him doing "Don't Curse" yes. and having a record with Cool G Rap and 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 Big Daddy Kane and and Q Tip and Grand Pooba and everybody and everybody on gets on Heavy D page. Like we gonna do this record with half, we ain't gonna curse, right? You know what I'm saying? Because Q Tip said, because that's the my my, my mother love my mother love Heavy D, so right. You know what I'm saying? Right. It was very and you know he just was it's a warm, gentle soul. Um, but about his business, yes, and about his music, yes. Um, Andre Harrell. Let's go back to Andre Harrell because you said he had a good. Eye for talent. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you. You know, the mm-hmm. cast for House Party. You talk to Robin Harris, mm-hmm. John Witherspoon, rest in peace, mm. uh, Martin Lawrence, Tisha Campbell, Full Force. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to me about how you, because these most of these people were not famous at all. Right. So this cast, what, what happened? Well, it was crazy because, like, for example, Martin Lawrence mm-hmm. uh, knew Kit and Play because they all worked at Sears together at one point. Wow. Okay, yeah, Queens. <laughs> you know. And Martin Lawrence also, I heard he worked at, he just said on the run for the bad boys that he worked telemarketing with Salt and Pepper too. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. They, were, the they were all crew. All they right. were all crew hanging out. Yeah. You know, look, there's nothing like the young and broke days. Ugh. Those are fantastic. Can I get out of those? When you're in them, you're like, <laughs> when's this over? Right. But, right, 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 right. But, when, but when you look back, you right. go, yo, I really sharpened my sword mm-hmm. being young and broke. Because you have nothing to do but just sit around. And if you are spending your time well, you're spending your time talking about your your oh, art, mm-hmm. whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just like, yo, I'm going to do it like this. Yeah. You know, and this is what's dope. I mean, I remember, you know, going to house parties in Harlem, sitting around with cats who, you know, Greg Tate, Mm -hmm. my man, you know, AJ, Arthur Jaffa now, who's a high-level artist. You know, Cassandra Wilson's here. And we'd be sitting around. they brought us to Cassandra Wilson crib, me and most deaf, when Blackstar dropped. Right. For dinner at her crib. Right. I was too young to really take about, but I remember being at that crib like, Right, you in it. Yeah. Here's the thing: it's okay that the water's up to here on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you sometimes you need to be yeah a, out of your depth just yeah. to know where deepness lies. Yeah, it was the type of thing she's like, oh y'all, y'all. So y'all rap, huh? <laughs> like that type of that's shit. how I was when I met Talib though, because like we were randomly at Jeff Ross house and it's Dave Chappelle and Talib's DJing, and I'm like texting my mom like, where the fuck am I at? Is this real life right now? <laughs> no, but but th- that's not. what it always is. I remember when we first were coming out to LA, there was this thing MGM. Grand Air, mm-hmm. right? And it was the first, we're like, there's carpeting all over the plane. <laughs> there's a chair right. that can spin around like this. <laughs> you know? Right. So we were in the lounge, mm-hmm. and in the lounge was Sidney Poitier, Carol Burnett. Um, I mean, it was crazy. Murray Poppins was in there. What? Yeah, right. <laughs> so me and my brother were like, where's a phone? So we went to find a pay phone, mm-hmm. and we were like, Mama! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Guess gu- guess who we with? Yeah. Right? Yes. You gotta make calls to mama yes. at crucial moments. Yes. It's a, it's who a, else you gonna tell? I right. called my father Who's when I when, excited? I when I met Lana Ritchie. Yes. I put my father on the phone with Lana Ritchie. Yes. Yeah. I remember, yeah, I brought my dad out and it was like one of the it was, it was a Hollywood party. So uh-huh. I'm like, Dad, you come with us. Right. And Sydney Partier's there, right? Mm. And Sydney Partier in real life. Mm-hmm. Is royalty. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, he's tall, he's elegant, mm-hmm. he's everything you think of Sidney Poitier, he is that for real, mm-hmm. right? So I introduced my dad to Sidney Poitier. So Sidney Poitier says, look at you. You're handsome, you're rich, and these are your sons? I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy that you're saying this to me. Go ahead. Right. So my dad literally just floats away. Like, he's done. Yeah. Right? He just yeah. got gassed up by Sidney Poitier. Which which also taught me like what well, this is what's mm. what how you should use your stardom. Mm-hmm. You know, this man who everyone's sweating at Sydney Poitier, he took three minutes to be an incredibly generous mm-hmm. to my father. It's and amazing. at that point I was like, 
I owe the Sydney party in my life. I mean, look at what he just did. Right. You know, he took the, that time to make my dad happy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's bigger than anything he could do for me to make, make my father happy. And I just said, well, that's how you have to be in life. You have to be that person. Yes. Just take a minute and just give people that. Yeah, my father was in a movie with Sidney Poitier. What? Um, my father, you know, we spoke about my parents, uh, yes. Stanley Green and Jerody Green. Yes, sir. Um, but my father, uh, Perry Green, was an actor. And I'm, I'm struggling to remember, remember the name of the movie. Mm-hmm. But he was in the movie when he was like, I want to say 10, 11. Mm. He played Sidney Poitier's son. Wow. Such um, cool parents. You know. Uh, Black excellence. Black <laughs> um, excellence. Yeah, that's the theme. That's the theme. Coming back. Coming back. Yes. In uh, speaking of house party, we know that you it derived from your thesis, your twenty minute thesis. How did you take that thesis and turn it into the whole screenplay? Well, the ending's the same. <laughs> you know, he sneaks out of the house. He has a wild set of adventures. He comes home, and his daddy's waiting for him, and he whoops that ass. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that just came from me collecting stories from my friends and family. Mm-hmm. Like my middle brother, Christopher, used to, I mean, used to sneak out all the time oh, no. because he had a window right under his, right over his bed. So he would go to sleep and then climb out the window and party and come back. So one time he was climbing in through the window and he was falling onto the bed. And my father had fallen asleep in the bed. Oh my God. So I just remember being in my room and hearing, wow. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I won't be doing that. I was like, you know, the, when you're the youngest, you just peep game, right? Yeah. You just go, okay, that's a good play. That's mm-hmm. a bad play. So I, but I remember that distinct, distinctively. I was like, well, you can't have a better ending than that, right? Mm-hmm. This kid goes through all these adventures. He, you know, doesn't get beat up by the bullies. He mm-hmm. meets the girl. You know, everything happens, and it all looks wonderful. But you know what? You still snuck out the house. Yeah. And there's still consequences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That movie is impactful on so many different levels, um, and it's so uh, authentic on so many different levels, from the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, trying to pick up a girl, you know, on Daddy. the dance floor or the ain't my tape of hype, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Dance scene. Um, but for me as a as a lyricist, um, Kid and Play was also the happy rap category. Mm-hmm. Um, but they had bars. And the, the movie showcased the art of rap mm-hmm. through the battle scene and through the jail scene. Um, like, was that a decision on your part? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, the movie's just me. Right? Yeah. And I wrote yeah. it, I directed it. And look, I I, I loved hip hop. Yeah. You know, it was exploding at the same time. I mean, Rapids of Light came out basically the year I went to college. Right. And, but even before that, I mean, my brother was living in New York. Mm-hmm. I remember he would say, look, there's this phenomenon that's happening long before things mm-hmm. were put on record. You know, and remember the Rock Steady crew, the dance crew mm-hmm. wanted Absolutely. my brother Warrington to manage them. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. So okay. I would go to Brooklyn, I would go to different places and see hip hop as a life phenomenon mm-hmm. even before it became an industry. Right. So I was a fan from before the beginning. Right. And those are the things that I loved about it. So I'm just a fan yeah. with access to equipment. Mm-hmm. You're, you you have the element, you're trying to, you, the, the element of the DJ, like the experience with the DJ, where the DJ has to go through with the with that equipment. Right. And how he felt about my records. I'm like, what do you, you know, it was very, that's like, you had to, you had to have been t- from the culture. Um, but the reason I had asked that, that in that way is because people didn't really look at Kid and Play as lyrical rappers. And I think you were able to bring that out. And yeah. showcase like this is this is a a skill in their in their wheelhouse. I mean, again, the dismissiveness mm-hmm. of the happy, happy rap. rap, right? Like whatever that it like know it, it like okay, do it now, right? If it's nonsense, right now, make a happy rap record, right? Please, right? <laughs> because I'm about to make one right now. <laughs> I mean, it, to me, it's always funny to me <laughs> that people. As much right. as, you know, certain people in hip hop talk about making money and getting paid, mm-hmm. it's all about money. I'm like, but you're not Will Smith. And who's mm-hmm. made more money in hip hop than Will Smith? Right. Who's more iconic? Well, yeah. Like, okay, you had a giant records, giant movies, mm-hmm. giant TV shows. There is no medium, there is no platform yeah. where Will Good Smith point. has not rung the bell at the highest level. Good mm-hmm. point. Right? So if you're really about money, then you should be, Make you a should be making 20 <laughs> Fresh Princes. Right. <laughs> Word up. But that's the thing. He's so successful now. That's why I love that, like, on this latest press tour, 
he actually. Do you see him do a brand new funk? Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, my mm-hmm. God. It's just <laughs> it's out of the ordinary. Out of the extraordinary. Right. I yeah. mean, it's just like, in case you forgot, mm-hmm. in case you think this cat was, oh, he was okay back then. No, 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 no. Mm-hmm. Right here, right now. Right. Please. Right. Um, what's interesting to me about House Party is mm-hmm. in that time period in America, um, AIDS awareness was a hot button topic. Mm-hmm. Um, and particularly for dis, uh, disproportionately poor communities, marginalized communities, communities of color, we didn't have the luxury to to not pay attention mm-hmm. to AIDS. Mm-hmm. Um, the hip hop community community has stepped up, in my opinion, in a big way to where there was a lot of rap records. It was almost a prerequisite. Put on your Jimmy hat. Stay strapped up. I will, you know, safe sex was a big topic. In House Party, that's a big topic in the movie. Um, talk to me about the decision to make that a mm-hmm. big part of that movie. Right. Well, first of all, again, amongst the many things hip hop doesn't get credit for mm-hmm. is that there's no genre more lyrically responsible Mm -hmm. than hip-hop. Yeah, I I agree with that. I mean, yes, 70s R&B had a lot of political songs. Yes. Obviously, you know, the greatest album ever made, Marvin Gaye's What's Going going On, on, right? Mm -hmm. So you Mm -hmm. you could name that, Mm -hmm. but in terms of just sheer number of artists saying something, sending a positive political message, Mm -hmm. nothing beats hip-hop. Right. Right? As much as it gets uh, attacked and denigrated, it's like, no, no, no. R&B wishes they were responsible as hip-hop is. Mm. So that's number one. Uh, number two is, yeah, uh, the movie actually um, was a stealth bomber, mm. right? I mean, part of it was me wanting, part of it was I was packing, I had written a script all summer. And it was, the summer was over, I'm packing up to go back to college, and the radio's on. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of black music videos. Mm -hmm. So I would make videos in my mind as an exercise, right? So I was unpacking. So Luther Vandross's Bad Boy having a party's on. Oh, so which is such an integral part of that movie. Yes. So I'm making a video in my head Mm -hmm. while I'm packing. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, wow, that's a really good video. Then I was like, no, that's a movie. That's a movie. So after spending all summer writing one script, I wrote another script overnight. Mm. Wow. Based on that. Mm. And it was like, well, all right. Right. And you know, and the thing is, it's like, and that's the key when I was saying before about writing, right? So I spent all summer writing. So mm. every day you write, that's push ups. Yeah. Right. Right. So then when lightning struck, right, I had done my push ups mm-hmm. and I could bang it out like that because mm. I had done the work. Right. So I, I have the idea and I have a, just enough craft to actually get it down. Right. Boom. And um, and I was like, look, I hate movies that are preachy. So I want to make a fun movie because if you're not having fun, no one wants to hear your message, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I mean, like Keenan brilliantly did later with "Don't Drink Your Juice and Self Central." Message, right. like, <laughs> message. Yeah. You never want to be right. that guy, right? Ever. Right. So it's like, look, we're going to have a movie that is so much fun mm-hmm. that everyone can relate to in terms of the experiences. And at the crucial moment, you know, he's with the girl, he's alone, but he's kept his condom in his wallet for 10 million years. Right. And it's done for. <laughs> right. And, you know, that's a, a, another experience a lot of people can relate to. That used to, to happen. Yeah, a lot. It don't happen that much anymore. Condom. Right. But, but that used to happen. That was a thing. That was a thing because, you know, you knew you needed it. Right. But, you know, your game was raggedy. It's not right. like, oh, it's just, you know. So the point was, okay, so your condom's garbage. <laughs> now what are you going to do? Right. Right? And do, do you do you go raw or do you go, I guess, another time? Mm-hmm. And I just want to see our hero make that choice, I guess, another time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's the heroic decision. It is not a big moment. They're not horns blowing mm-hmm. off. He just goes, ah. Yeah. Right. And that's it. Yeah. That's it. So the nice thing was the movie comes out. It's successful. And we get this award from this health clinic in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there with the doctor who runs the clinic. And I go, you know, this is really, really nice. I really appreciate you guys are honoring us. But I mean, really, I mean, mean, is it really? I mean, it's just a movie. Right. He goes, no, 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 no. Young people come into our clinic all the time and they ask for condoms and they 
reference house party wow. as a reason why they are using condoms. So no, 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 this is not, this is for real. Mm -hmm. You made a difference. And that was a really crucial message to get early on mm. because you, you know, you go, Oh, you mean if you do it subtly, tastefully, da, 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 you can still really impact people. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, okay, well, you just really gave me a positive reward for this. So this is what I'm about. That is amazing. That's I amazing. mean, I, I've definitely, back in the day, dealt with crusty condoms. But <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's awesome. And what's your that, stance on the crusty condoms? I'm, I'm ste steroid free. I'm STD free. <laughs> so, you know, that's great. But uh, Kid and Play, they were the first rappers to have their own movie, serial, cartoon. And you were a big part of, of, of that. How did you feel about helping them blow up and become like this broad phenomenon? That's great. That's what it's all about. You know, I mean, I mean, the thing is, you know, for a long time in Hollywood, there's like one black star, mm -hmm. right? It's one like, in, one out. It's Sidney Poitier. Okay, now it's Denzel. It's Bill Cosby. Now it's Richard Pryor. It's mm -hmm. the one of a time thing. And part of that is it's to be a star, you need a consistent flow of great vehicles, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That show you at your best. Mm -hmm. And when black filmmakers started coming up, we could we couldn't afford the stars that already existed. So we were making our own stars mm -hmm. and creating vehicles that showed off what they were. So, you know, look, I love everyone on that on that movie. So to see, you know, kid and play blow up, fantastic. To see Martin become Martin, great. Mm. To, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, everyone. They're all my friends, and I love them all, and mm -hmm. I want to see my friends succeed. So, yeah, it was it was great. One of the, uh, I can't remember which one it is. It's either kid or play, but one of them is a professor at FAMU currently. You're talking yes. about uh, play. play. Play, yes. Play. Yeah, kid is out here in L.A. being funny. Oh, yeah, because I ran into him in a club, and I, yeah. you know how sometimes Chris you Reed. meet celebrities and you don't yeah. know mm -hmm. how you know them? Mm -hmm. And I spoke to him, and I was like, hey, and he was like, I don't know you, and I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> right? Yeah, no, but Zach, but you, but, but I feel very close to you. Yeah, yeah. I grew up with you. <laughs> so I grew up together. You know You're I mean? my homie. Yeah. Exactly. I remember um, there was a um, unsung episode about kitten play, mm -hmm. and that was the occasion that we kind of were finally all back together, mm -hmm. and it was really like a high school reunion. That, you know, Tisha and AJ mm. and Kit and Play and, you know, we're all there for the screening and then we hung out afterward. And it was, again, like high school, mm -hmm. we just went back into our same modes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just right. like, oh, we just are who we are. Right. It was beautiful. It's Kit and Play. Yeah. Right. Dividing the scene, yo, Herb. Tell them what it means. Confused by the words it's saying? We're not serious. We're just Kit and Playing. Two guys. Are we shy bull like the tower? We're an eyeful. That was my favorite lyric for years. It's a spectacular line. Yeah. It's, and y'all well, get it right. We we, we get it. <laughs> what was great is I showed that episode to my kids, uh -huh. and they flipped over everything. They were like the clothing. Mm -hmm. You know, we started playing kid and play in the car on the way to school, mm -hmm. and they were just. I mean, I was like, oh, this is how like the '90 revival happens, right? Mm -hmm. Some kids who were not alive in that time go. Everything I'm seeing is cool about that. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. want to go back to that. Yeah. So I was like, this is great. Um, let's talk about Boomerang. Yes. You directed the the beautiful movie <sighs> Boomerang. Um, let's before we get into Boomerang, let's talk about Eddie Murphy's recent comeback. If you know, his his Saturday Night Live, Dolomite. How are you feeling about everything that Eddie's doing now? Well, it's great. I mean, because here's the thing about Eddie. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm very been very fortunate to work with some of the funniest people on the planet. Yes, you have. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to any of those people, they all will agree Eddie's the funniest of them all. Yeah. Hey, Crib. And and it's not like, oh, you know, Eddie lost it. No, Eddie just stopped working mm -hmm. because he wasn't happy with what he was doing. He was yeah. like, I don't need to do this. I didn't lose my money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just going to hang out with my kids. Right. Yeah. Right. So he made that choice, mm -hmm. which is amazing for black artists to be able to even be able to make that choice. That's right. Right. That's right. And so finally he wanted to go back to work. Right. And, you know, we had talked about, uh, you know, you know, 
if you work with Eddie, eventually you will be in a, his screening room and you will watch Dolomite. Right. That is just part of the process. Right. And watching Eddie watch Dolomite and his running commentary as the movie plays, mm -hmm. it's still the funniest possible thing you can ever experience because mm. he's just critiquing. It's hilarious. It's like Mystery Science Theater 3000. Right. But to the 10th power. But with Eddie Murphy. With Eddie Murphy. Uh. Wow. Yeah, so of yeah. course him doing this movie was going to be a success. There was no doubt. Yeah. It was amazing watching him on that. I did background on Dolomite too, and just like watching like such a megastar get into his character and like running his lines in his head and just like thinking like, what are you, what are you thinking about? Like, what are you, where are you going to come and put on this amazing performance? Mm. Boomerang, super black. Mm -hmm. I mean, blackity black, 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 black. Like Midnight on Broadway and Myrtle? Yeah, black like that. <laughs> How important for you was it to showcase black success on that scale? Yeah, again, you know, I always have a secret agenda, mm -hmm. right? So in the same way that promoting safe sex with the secret agenda mm -hmm. of House Party, the secret agenda of Boomerang um, was to smash this false choice that we were always given in movies and TV shows. Right. Which is that... If you were a successful, educated black person, mm. you were corny. Mm. Right. And if you were cool, you had to be broke and struggling. Right. And it's like, well, that's actually not true. Mm -hmm. I know a bunch of very cool, successful people. Mm -hmm. And let's just show that thing that they never show. Mm -hmm. Let's get rid of that false barrier between success and cool. Right. Um, so Eddie uh, called us right after House Party. And was like, hey, you guys are funny. Right. Why don't we work together? I was like, and it freaked wow. me out because it's like, even though Eddie and I are the same age, mm -hmm. like I felt like he was on Saturday Night Live and I had a bedtime. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I, just, I couldn't right. reconcile. Right. But it's like, okay. So we were just throwing ideas back and forth for a while. And then he sent the script for Boomerang. And when I read it, I was like, this is what needs to be done. Right. Because we have not seen a black romantic comedy. Right. Just jamming black people in love. Mm. We're all of that age. That's that's what it's about. So, yeah, yeah let's make that movie. Yeah. Uh, so that was item one, right? And I remember uh, I had show Eddie this book of uh, clothing design by Terry Mugler. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yo, I want to wear those clothes in the movie. I'm like, that's a great idea. So, like... Eddie in this movie is a top executive, but he never has a tie on. Mm -hmm. And all his suits are fly, fly, yeah. fly. So remember at the end of the movie, because uh, yeah, at the time, Eddie and I were the same size. I was like, hey, I want some of those. Some of those <laughs> they were like, oh, no, Eddie took all the clothes. Oh, <laughs> all the clothes? All the clothes. I was like, Eddie, even the duplicates. I got a brother. <laughs> Rest in Fine. peace to Charlie. Rest in peace, my man, Charlie. The beautiful, uh, you know, while we were shooting the movie, Eddie would tell us those true Hollywood yes. stories. Yeah. Wow. And so when Chappelle shot them and put them on the show, literally me and a couple of the other comics were like, yeah, we all could have done that. Yep. But but Chappelle knew what to do with those yeah. stories. Yeah. We just all laughed and went home. Yeah. Chappelle had the genius to say, no, no, no. That's, that. 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 That's right. Beautiful. What was your favorite true Hollywood story that he told? I, well, well, I got to choose. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a zero sum game. <laughs> exactly. What are your favorites? Look, I mean, well, if you got to choose between the Prince story and the Rick James story, yeah. that's not fair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I agree. True. Um, mm, Halle Berry went from like girl next door to leading lady yeah. in that time period. Yeah. Well, the crazy part was, you know, toning her down for the movie. Okay. Right? Because, again, she was an unknown. Yeah. Right? So we're going to play her as the arty chick mm -hmm. who gets overlooked. Right. Ugly duckling. Because of her personality. Mm -hmm. Right? She's not out there. You know, while Robin Givens is like, mm -hmm. I'm that chick. Mm -hmm. Notice me. And thing is, Robin really is, an um, you know, a, a, an amazing lady mm -hmm. who, and I remember at the time, the studio was nervous about Robin because yeah, it was, it was a like, lot of, she was a like, polarizing figure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, oh, she took down the champ. And mm -hmm. I'm like, that's the point. Yeah, like, that's the, everyone yeah. knows Eddie's formidable, right? right? He's out there, he's dating all these amazing women. He meets his match with Robin Givens. Mm -hmm. So they were nervous about it. 
Um, yeah, the casting was brilliant. I mean, it's, yeah. So I mean, <laughs> but, and this is the thing, you know. So Eddie and I had a conversation, and he was like, "I think it should be Robin." Mm -hmm. I mean, she's great. I mean, because every time she came in to read, she was killer. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, we were like, "Wouldn't it be great to have a dark-skinned sister be?" the woman who everyone agrees is beautiful and everyone's pursuing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was like, then we're done. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty when you have a black star with all that power, working mm -hmm. with a black director, you can have that conversation. It, you don't take more than five minutes to have that conversation, right. but that conversation can change the world. Right. And you just get it done. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Now, speaking of black star power. Yes, sir. You were president of BT. Yes. For a number of years. Did you come up with Black Star Power? I did not. That was before right. my time. All right. I need I have a bone to pick with the person who did that. <laughs> I have a group called Black Star, and I was like, hey. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing out here? What are we really doing out here? <laughs> but you did come up with the BET Honors. Yes. And the Hip Hop Awards. Yes. Oh, man. What led you to that? Well, I mean, they were just obvious things to me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, okay. That's a good was, answer. I mean, it was just like, well, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I was like, look. You know, why don't we do a show that celebrates hip hop? Right. And you know, Pretty obvious. And at the time, there was a lot of tension. I was mm. like, let's just do it in Atlanta. That way, we're not favoring right. east mm -hmm. or west. Let's just meet in the middle and do this show that celebrates hip hop. Mm -hmm. And everybody was like, mm. I was like, what? I mean, right. that was like th my first week. Right. <laughs> you know, like right. we're done here. And then, <laughs> it's a wrap. <laughs> what are we doing next? <laughs> and, and then um, it was, I was like, well, we have, you know, the BT Awards, which are great, mm -hmm. but there's all these legends that need to be celebrated. Mm. And, you know, we should have a show that we can put on around Martin Luther King weekend mm -hmm. that celebrates our titans. Mm -hmm. So that became BT Honors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, look, we did a lot of interesting things. We did Sunday Best. Because mm -hmm. I was like, you know, okay, there's got, you know... Um, you got, you know, America, uh, America's Got Talent mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, you know, American Idol and whatever. I was mm -hmm. like, but where are the greatest singers? Right. The greatest singers are in the church. In gospel. Right. Right. And, you know, BET Sunday programming was so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I was like, look, let's not take that Sunday audience for granted. Mm -hmm. Let's give them something special. Let's give them something awesome. So we created Sunday Best, which is still on. Right. I mean, it's a, it was a, a giant hit show. I mean, we did a lot of really fun things. Mm. Uh, I mean, look, when I got the day, it shut down the news division. We reopened the news division. Mm -hmm. And in a year, we had won 14 awards for our news reporting. We were, you know, reporting on Blood Diamonds, you know, all kinds of amazing stuff. So, I mean, when I got the phone call, which was kind of out of the blue. And they were like, look, um, we're looking for someone to be the creative, you know, head of BET. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like, this is the B biggest black media company in the world. Right. And they want my help in taking it in a new direction. Mm -hmm. Well, there's only one answer, which is yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. Um, Did you have anything to do with the boomerang that's on BET now? No. No? Oh. What does a boomerang on BET now? Yeah, it's a TV show based around the movie. Yes, mm -hmm. oh, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I hope nobody I want on the show is working on that show. It's a lot of new new people. So. Okay, anyway, they have to get their bars up before they get to the people. So, um, you were also an executive producer on the Boondocks. Yes, for three for three seasons. Yeah, um, the Boondocks uh, it obviously is a cultural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when. It was when Aaron was writing Boondocks in the newspapers. It, he would reference Black Star, mm -hmm. and it was a it was a great thing. To, I mean, back in the days when I used to read the Daily News comic strip. Um, now the Boondocks, at some point, did episodes making fun of you. Mm -hmm. What's the story there? And those episodes were banned episodes mm -hmm. that didn't actually air, but came out like on DVD mm -hmm. or something like that. What's the story there? Well, I mean, um, Aaron was writing the cartoon um, on, um, you know, in his, his college newspaper. Mm -hmm. And he got hooked up with an attorney who was also my attorney. Mm -hmm. And they were like, Reggie, you know about comic books and comic strips and mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, would you meet with this guy and kind of help him? Because none of us understand that world. Mm -hmm. And it's a world I 
have studied right. You're quite into a bit. graphic novels, comics, all that. I mean, the fact that most people don't know the difference between a comic book and a comic strip, right? right? So we got together, and obviously he's enormously talented, mm -hmm. and we started, you know, working on the strip, mm -hmm. and uh, then the strip got sold and went national. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to have the books back in the days. Right. Yeah. So we really worked very closely on everything, mm -hmm. you know, on the, you know, I would put together writer's room because it was just an enormous amount of work. It mm -hmm. really never done anything on that scale before. So working on this trip and then putting together the series, putting together the voice cast, you know, it was an enormous amount of work doing right. it all, but it was really fun to do mm -hmm. because it was clear this is a voice that needed to be heard by yeah. folks. Uh, and it was a great, it was a great thing. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, Aaron really, like Aaron kind of has this thing where he's just like, he just wanted to, you know, he was just like, well, what have you done? And I'm okay. like, well, if you don't know, then. It's mm -hmm. a problem. Okay. Good luck. Right. So, you know. So it just I had parted ways and yeah. he, that was his response to it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, you know, it's very tough to understand what it takes to succeed and mm -hmm. keep things going over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he didn't see it. Um, you went on to produce uh, or be a producer on Django Unchained. Yes. Which is a fantastic movie. I love that movie. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of controversy that was surrounding it that, that always surrounds Tarantino. Yeah. Um, especially when he deals with uh, race issues. Mm -hmm. um, which is, which, what's this, what's your favorite Tarantino movie? Do you have one? It's kind of a three-way tie. Mm -hmm. You know, Pulp Fiction mm. is a giant movie. Yeah. I mean, it changed, it changed the game. It changed the game. Yeah. It, I mean... Changed the game I mean, completely forever. Yeah. I mean, filmmakers before and after mm -hmm. Pulp yeah. Fiction. It's just, yeah. So you you have to put that as a contender. Inglorious Bastards is a brilliant, brilliant movie mm -hmm. because he made... First of all, he made this amazing Jew exploitation movie. Mm -hmm. It's a black exploitation movie, but for the Jewish community. Yeah. And I love that. I related to that and I felt that, mm -hmm. you know? And... And the, the 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 nerve to alter history, yeah. right? And you just go... He keeps doing it, too. Right. And so to just be like, oh, I didn't know I needed to see Hitler's face shot off. Yeah. But now that you've given it to me, I'm really grateful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. And he's been doing it. He did it with the with the Manson family murders in this right, recent exactly. movie. Right, exactly. So, I mean, just the, the freedom of imagination to do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Django's a movie I'm very, very proud of. Mm -hmm. You won an Oscar for that. Yeah, yeah, and well deserved. I mean, because for me, it was very simple. Mm. You know, it's a it's a movie about a black man who gets his freedom, mm -hmm. and then says, "No, no, no, not without my wife." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, "No, no, your wife is still in hell." And he goes, "Okay, I'll kill anyone between me and my wife." Now, for me, if that's what you want to make a movie about, and you want my help, I'm all in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if someone it sounds has a like problem, we gonna make that movie. We gonna make that movie. <laughs> right. And if someone has a problem with that movie, I don't know what you're trying to say, mm -hmm. but that's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Anyone between me and my wife, you done. It's crazy how much that movie makes you laugh, even though it's like a slave movie, because it's like some of the racist things that are said. You're like, what the hell? Well, it's like, absurdist, right? What? There's a, there's, a, there's a, a, a a piece of it that's absurd. Yeah. And there's a piece of it that's he likes black exploitation. He likes spaghetti westerns. Mm -hmm. He likes revenge fantasy. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he he. And that's what I appreciate about Tarantino's style, because um, like he used to work in a in a video store, right? right? So he spent his time watching these movies over and over again, right? And his style feels like the style of a guy who just watched a bunch of movies it's just uh, he's like you know what at this point in the movie it's gonna be anime mm -hmm. and now you know what now i just gonna have a guy narrate and and now it's just gonna be like a bloody revenge fantasy and now it's gonna be like a spaghetti western and then it's gonna he's like he's like whatever i feel like doing i'm gonna do at that point whatever mm -hmm. feels right it's freedom yeah and there's no rules and it's like well why can't you everything everything you like in one movie yeah mm -hmm. and, and and the thing is again you you look at this body of work, right? You just mm -hmm. go, okay, so you have this super empowered woman mm -hmm. in Kill Bill. Right. Right? You, you know, you have the Jewish community finally get their get their revenge mm -hmm. in Inglorious Bastards. You have black people whooping ass 
in Django Unchained, mm -hmm. but no one calls him a social justice warrior mm -hmm. because the movie works as a movie. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. spectacular entertainment, yeah. and the messaging and the liberation in all that, you just accept that as part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I remember, you know, people were calling me, and they were like, oh, have you heard about this new Quentin Tarantino movie, Django Unchained? I'm like, yes, in fact. I, I have heard some, <laughs> I, I, I've heard some things. Go, <laughs> and they're like, it's terrible. I said, have you read the script? Mm -hmm. And they go, no. I'm like, well, I have. And I think it's great. <laughs> so that's exactly how they say it. Right. <laughs> so the movie comes out, and everybody who was mad preemptively mm -hmm. with no knowledge gets quiet. Mm -hmm. They don't say you were right. They just mm -hmm. go, "Yeah, that was pretty good." Mm -hmm. And then other movies about slavery come out, and then they're like, "Yeah, man, I was watching that other movie, and I kept waiting for Django to ride in." <laughs> <I'm> like, oh! <laughs> Right, 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 right. After Django, we didn't need any more slavery. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> well, that's not true. Uh, right. The truth, and I people are like, ah. but <laughs> but the fact is, look, there's a there's a lot of movies about the Holocaust mm -hmm. because not only everyone needs to remember, mm -hmm. right? The Jewish community can never forget. Mm -hmm. People who are not Jewish need to remember, mm -hmm. so that doesn't happen again. Or when it happens again, we recognize the signs and take appropriate action. That's right. And we need to do the same thing. And black folks are always like, oh, I don't want to. And it's like, no, no, no. It's not that you don't want to see movies about slavery. You don't want to see a bad movie about That's slavery. Right. Okay. That's right. You need to, you want to see something different. Okay, I saw that one. Okay, do you have something new to add yeah. to the subject? And if you have something new to add, then, then that's it. a different point. Right. And, pe and people always act like, well, I want to see a movie about happy black people. Again, it's not a choice. You watch something mm -hmm. on TV every night. You can watch a slave movie on Thursday, or rather a freedom movie on Thursday, and then you can watch you know, blackish on Friday. Yeah. Right. And then you can, you know, it's like yeah. you can, you can watch Watchmen on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. right. It's all there. You got plenty of time. Yeah. You watching some really stupid stuff. I bet. <laughs> Making some stupid choices. I bet you can take two hours of right. your year to watch the one movie that will elevate your game mm -hmm. about something that for better or for worse shaped us as black Americans. I agree. Oh, I agree. Um, you are very much into sci-fi yes. and, Afrofuturism. Yes. Um, I remember feeling liberated when Cosmic Slop came out. Thank you. On sir. HBO. Yes. Um, a sci-fi show. Mm -hmm. um, on the song Astronomy, uh, Black Star, mm -hmm. I have a lyric, uh, uh, deeper than faces at the bottom of the well. Mm. I've been there before. Mm. We bring the light and heat it up like La Cocina, That's make what I imagine happen, but maybe I'm just a dreamer. Right? So this is why I say he's my hero. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> like, come on. Right. You're referencing Faces at the Bottom of the Well. Right. Spectacular. Right. Derek Bell. Yes, sir. Professor um, Derek Bell. Yeah, Professor Derek Bell. Now, talk to me about the the episode of Cosmic Slop that was based on that book. Right. Professor Derek Bell mm -hmm. taught at Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm. And as he taught classes, he would make up these science fiction fables to kind of illustrate his legal points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he took those lessons and compiled them into a book called Faces at the Bottom of the Well. And the, the theme is about the permanence of racism. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, race is a social construct, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a real thing. There's more differences um, within any racial group than there are between races, mm -hmm. genetically, right? Because mm -hmm. there's certain diseases, for example, that only affect black people and people in Nordic countries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you go... Right. Well, what does what do me and a guy from Sweden have in common? Well, we both have this weird genetic thing. Mm -hmm. That said, once you introduce the concept of racism, it's um, you can't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. It's one of those diseases. Like that's it for the rest of your life. You're right. stuck with it. So he broke it down in all these really interesting ways. And one of them was this story called Space Traders, mm -hmm. which is about these aliens who land on Plymouth Rock. They go to the president and say, "Mr. President." We're space traders. We go around the galaxy making deals. Here's the deal we propose to you. We will give you clean, renewable energy, endless mineral wealth, and wipe out all your air and water pollution. And all we want in return is all your black people. Mm. No questions asked. We will not coerce you. You have 17 days to make your decision. 
to take the deal or not. Mm -hmm. So when I read that, I was like, whoa, right. that's hot. <laughs> so start making videos of it in his mind. Right. right. That's how it starts, right. right? So I I did a deal with HBO and we did basically a backdoor pilot for a Black Twilight Zone series. Mm. Right. And that was sort of the pilot episode. Yeah. And it was very successful when we won awards and all that stuff. It was great. The show ended up not going forward. Mm -hmm. But that episode took on this huge cult underground life. What year was this? What year was that? I was a kid. I remember I was a kid living in my parents' house. I was like, because I don't remember this. No, I was a child. No, no, no. I was, this is really some, I'm maybe 95, 97, something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, actually, I found it's taught in universities all over the country. Mm. You know, because I'm calling, you know, professors right. are very academic. Into, right. When I knew we were successful was when Obama's was running for re-election. Mm -hmm. Right. And the right wing were trying, like, how can we smear this guy? He's so mm -hmm. popular. We got to dog him. So they, they want to take Professor Derek Bell mm -hmm. and turn him into like this evil black man. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember that. So they had footage of the of, of uh, Professor Derek Bell who said, look, if you don't give a black woman tenure here at Harvard Law School, I'm going to leave. Mm -hmm. And all these students are rallying around him. And one of the leaders of the protest movement was Barack Obama. Right. So they're like, look, here they are. You know, um, they created this new axis of evil. So it was like Professor Derek Bell and Barack Obama and this Hollywood guy, Reggie Hutland, <laughs> made a movie about one of, you know, Derek Bell's crazy ideas. Right. So I'm like, yo, Sean Hannity the elitist is liberal. dogging me right. on national TV. Congratulations I for that. I made it. Congratulations. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes. That's I've dope. done the right thing. I'm on the right side. <laughs> that's right. You that's exactly right. right. Judge me by my enemies. Judge me by my enemies. Hey. That's my mantra. That's my mantra. So, in my life. I was very proud. No doubt. Very proud. Um, I'm happy to share enemies with you, bro. Yes, sir. Um, you wrote several Black Panther gra graphic novels for Marvel. Yeah. Um, you co-created the character Shuri. Yeah. Did you see her becoming as important to the culture of Black people mm -hmm. when you create her? Because she's very important to people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, at the time, um, it's funny, it happened at the same time. I got mm -hmm. offered the job running BET mm -hmm. and... I was writing Black Panther. Mm -hmm. So in my BET deal, I said, look, I have to keep writing Black Panther. Right. Because, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I need this. Right. Because right? I grew up on Black Panther. Mm -hmm. And um, so I said, look, um, so so when they offered it to me, I, they said, look, you could do a six-issue miniseries. I was like, great. Okay. Right. So I tell it all my friends, I'm all excited. Like, hey, I'm going to write Black Panther for Marvel. Right. And people were like, great. Who is that? Who is that? <laughs> like, I, it, but what? He's right. not the guy with the bow and arrow. No. Right. No. <laughs> so, right. uh, Bobby Seale? Right. Exactly. <laughs> so I said, okay. So my first story arc is going to be called Who is the Black Panther? Right. Just to bring people up to speed on who he was. Because remember, this is before Iron Man. This is before yeah. Marvel, Marvel Studios movies are hot. Yeah. yeah. Right. And there was no. Even though we all wanted to make a Black Panther movie, I mean, at one point after Boomerang, I had talked a studio into making a Black Panther movie. Mm. And it was going to be me directing and Wesley Snipes starring in it. Mm -hmm. And it didn't happen. Okay. So it was just like, so over the years, we've been trying to make the dream happen. Mm -hmm. So I was like, look, I don't know if a movie's ever going to happen, but at least I'll tell these six issues yeah. that will tell people who Black Panther is and, you know, yeah. kids will read it, da, da, da. And so I'm writing the book and I'm like, well, he's royalty. Mm -hmm. And you know, royalty, you always have to have an heir and a spare. Yeah. Right? He wouldn't be an only child. Yeah. So let's give him a sibling. Let's give him a sister for a couple of reasons. One is, A, you have the most conflict and difference, mm -hmm. right? You know, a little sister is... Going to be like, you ain't all that. Yeah. I can do everything you can do. Yeah. And little sisters, I mean, sisters are smarter. Yeah. Right? So Say it again. So oh, <laughs> she's going to talk smack, but be able to back it up. Yeah. Because she's going to be this brilliant scientist to encourage black girls to be like, you could be this jamming chick with yeah. all these math and science skills. And eventually, excuse me, and eventually 
Shuri would become the Black Panther herself. Yes. Mm. So ultimately, my kids, my son and daughter, will each be able to dress as Black Panther for Halloween. Yeah. That was the end game for me. Mm -hmm. Can we get Halloween costumes of Black superheroes mm. for my son and daughter? Mm. Right? So <laughs> cut to... You know, it's Halloween at my kid's school and all these kids, mm -hmm. black kids, white kids, right. Asian kids are rocking their Black, black Panther, Panther mm -hmm. costumes. Yeah. And you're like, yo, yo, that idea really worked. You did it. Yeah. You did it. It's crazy. Um, you also wrote Bride of the Panther, yeah. which T'Challa marries Storm yes. from X-Men. What made you want to put that black excellence together? Because they're, they're back, we back to black excellence again. Yes. Um... Well, once the miniseries, once I turned in my six issues, they were mm -hmm. like, well, what would happen if you kept going? Mm -hmm. I said, well, he's a prince who's now the king. Mm -hmm. Kings have to get married. Mm -hmm. I mean, the number one job is to make more royalty, right? Mm -hmm. So he's got to marry someone and have some kids. Mm -hmm. And who should the Black Panther marry, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, well, there's actually an African princess in the Marvel Universe. Right. Here's Storm. Storm, okay. Right? So it's just like, so they're coming together and, you know, and there was a story with the, uh, written in the 90s where they had actually met when they were young. Mm -hmm. So it was like, let's bring them back together, right? Let's rekindle that teen romance as adults, mm -hmm. right? And it's, you know, African royalty coming together. Yeah. It's also human and mutant coming together. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's bridging a lot of different worlds. It's very intersectional of you in the comic space. Yes. <laughs> so, okay, because I'm not a, I'm not a comic book. When, at what point did we lose you in this conversation? I'm, I'm still there, but it's just like... But you're like... <laughs> it's funny because <laughs> when Black Panther came out and everyone was like talking shit, these people don't even know about that show. I mean, they bought the comic books. I was like one of those people they were talking about. So like, was the movie... After your novels that you wrote, or how how similar was it to mm -hmm. what you wrote? And is storm? Are they going to have a storm in T'Challa movie later well, on? I don't know what they're going to do, <laughs> but one of the funny ironies of the merger between Disney and Fox is that it couldn't happen before because Storm is in the X Men, which was mm -hmm. controlled by Fox Studio, mm -hmm. right? And you know, Black Panthers at Disney. So it was like, they can never be together mm -hmm. because of corporate intrigue. Romeo and Juliet. But then the corporate intrigue went, uh, you know, got overcome when the two companies merged. That's how we get Spider-Man in the Avengers movies. Exactly. Yeah. So now, technically, it could happen. Again, not up to me. It's up to Kevin Feige and all the brilliant people over mm -hmm. at Marvel to make it happen. But it could happen. <laughs> I'm going to read a comic book now. <laughs> Dare. It's Dare okay. To, Dare to dream. <laughs> Dare to dream. Um, you, I want to thank you also for being supportive of me on Twitter. Of course, sometimes I get into sometimes. arguments with people. Every and, day. And Reg steps up to the plate, um, you know, with these with these ADOS people. Um, well, look, first of all, you're a hero. Mm -hmm. Oh, because man. Duly, I, because, you keep saying this. No, because oh. here's the thing. I mean, whenever I, I whenever I get in with mm -hmm. I argue with people online, mm -hmm. I feel so embarrassed because I know better. It's the <laughs> wrong. It's like, what are you doing? Why are you arguing with some dude in his basement? Uh -huh. You know, with missing front teeth. <laughs> <laughs> like, right? Shouldn't, shouldn't you be out making being Reginald Hudlin? Right? Like, what are sure. you doing? Right? But it's this amazing thing, right? And. It's not about convincing that person who you'll never convince. That's exactly right. It's all the other people who mm -hmm. are listening and watching, and they go, oh, wow, what Talib said, I hadn't thought about that. That's deep. Okay, now you've shown, you know, you've you opened my mind to how to think about whatever issue there yeah. is. Yeah. So I get sucked in. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, that one, I mean, you, you're 24, I mean, your stamina, you have hope level abilities <laughs> just to be like, ah, God, right. God, day and night, you know, sunset, sunrises, he's right. still there. Ah, 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 ah. You know Twitter what the secret superhero. is? Yeah. I'm always angry. No, <laughs> <laughs> no but the, actually the secret is, yeah. is the opposite of the Hulk. Because that's the Hulk secret, right? Right. My secret is I'm never angry. Right. That's my secret is that I'm really enjoying it. Right. Having a great time. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, I'm never angry. I wouldn't, like, I would, I have, I live a blessed life, brother. Mm. I don't have to be on Twitter. Right. I don't have to do, I just, 
I don't do much things that I don't want to do. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I've worked to earn that life. So mm-hmm. when you see me on it, it's because I really am enjoying it. I, and, look, and, and, and look, Joeful Warrior mm-hmm. is the key. Mm-hmm. Because, look, we've had a lot of heroes, you know, who died on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Okay? And that's noble. Mm-hmm. But we have to win for real, for real. Mm-hmm. Meaning we have to fight our wars, mm-hmm. go home, you know, have dinner with our kids, mm-hmm. get up and, you know, do something the next day. Right. Right. I mean, that's really, right. you know, the highest level, right? right. It isn't just, you know, you died an honorable death. No, 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 no. Right. We right. have to live and grow and, and, and do it all. And to do that, you have to be a joyful warrior, mm. yes. which is what you're describing. You appreciate the beauty of your life. Yes. And that's the start of that peace, mm-hmm. right? You can't have this knot in your stomach all day, mm-hmm. right? Walk around. Oh, this man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that will, you burn out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So you just got to be at peace and go. And just strategy wise for black people, yes. that anger, they use that as an excuse to Emmett yes. Till us real quick. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know? Yeah, exactly. No, it's got to be, you know, you got to be at Keanu at the end of the Matrix, right? Yeah. Just, that's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> you know, it. That's exactly on, it. You gotta be on that level of skills. Now, let me ask you this: as someone who, going back to the theme of black excellence, yes, sir. The Ados people, what they're trying to do is divide up black communities even further. Yes. Because I, th- you know, I, I have my my theories about what the motivation behind it is. Mm-hmm. But what on the surface they're trying to do is say that our justice claim has to be based on the lineage of we are the descendants of slaves. And because of that, we have to stand, uh, we have to have sort of right-wing conservative viewpoints about immigration. Right. Which aligns them with white nationalists. They're willing to forgive white nationalism and build a wall and be down with that stuff. They're willing to support ICE agents mm-hmm. publicly mm-hmm. because they feel like the more particularly black immigrants come, the harder it makes it for us to have jobs and the harder for us to, makes it for us to get reparations. Mm-hmm. As, as, as someone whose family was had conductors on the Underground Railroad. Mm-hmm. Nobody can question your lineage here as mm-hmm. a black American, as a black American from a family who overcame the odds despite what was thrown at them. How do you feel about this sort of right wing push towards anti immigration, towards fascism, and just this anti diversity push that's not just here in America, but it's in Brazil mm-hmm. and in and, and Brexit with in England all over the world right now. Well, I mean, look, it's a pattern, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it comes back to, you know, why did I mean when we made Django, you know, I did a really deep dive into studying slave mm-hmm. rebellions. Right. And you know, most slave rebellions fail because mm-hmm. there was someone who told Massa, mm-hmm. right? So, and you'll see that same idea and that same level of betrayal through the generations, mm-hmm. right? You know, into the 70s and you had the Black Panthers and they had, you know, a knockoff Black revolutionary organization that actually was a front for the CIA right. designed to, you know, disrupt what the Black Panthers were doing. Mm. So when I see what these guys are, I'm like, oh, I know who you, know you what are. This is. Right. Oh my God, you just right. change your hairstyle. Right. But it's, the, <laughs> right. it's the it's the same idea. Mm. You know, anytime people are against Black unity, yeah, mm-hmm. you go, what? Yeah. And that should be a red flag off top. Yeah. Off the. It's very very simple. Yeah. And I'm like, no no no, I, I look. I mean, look, I, I, the term African-American is fine, mm-hmm. but I've always liked black. Yeah. Because, I mean, black crosses all borders. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Black is global. Black is, you know, whether I'm in Africa, whether I'm in France, whether I'm in China, whether I'm in Brazil, mm-hmm. we are connected from a, from a, from the cultural diaspora. And when you say black, you're not talking skin color. You're talking no. a cultural diaspora thing. Exactly. Yeah. And again, I mean, these all these traps that people love to fall into, you know, people go, well, that person is not really black. Mm-hmm. You go, okay, but if that person who you're saying is not really black, if they said, I'm not black, I'm white, the first thing you said, you black? Exactly. Oh, you're yeah. trying to say exactly. you ain't black? Yeah. It's like, yeah. no, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it both right? ways. Right? Either mm-hmm. someone is black and we claim them or not. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and we have to, have to be able to claim all of it. The people we don't like. We have to claim Ben Carson. We have to claim Candace Owens. Whether you agree with them or not, they black black are people born in America. Yeah. One of the... Yeah, the, I mean, I, I, I'm just talking <laughs> scientifically. No, no, no. Like, well, no, no. Hmm? 2,000% true. Yeah. I mean, the, the truth is, look, the reality is when I think about what we as a people need mm-hmm. to do, we have to create a bigger tent. Yeah. 
right? You know, because, you know, and for some, you know, and we have to stop using black as a descriptor when it doesn't fit. Yeah. You may right. say, oh, that person's a coon mm-hmm. because of the movies or the records they make. No, they're not a coon, they're a hack. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's the difference. Okay. Are you denigrating black people or are you just making some stuff that I don't respect? Right. Right? Let's just really be yeah. precise in our language about how you feel about somebody. Yeah. And, okay, there are people who are like, I hate their politics. But they're black. They just have politics I hate. Yeah. Right? They're still and, black. And, and, and here's the reality. Um, I mean, we're as we diversify as a people, as we have a bigger and wider range of experiences, Right. We're not going to have all the same reference points. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a point where, like, everyone was a generation away from slavery or everybody was from whatever. But that's not going to be the case anymore. There's going to be black people growing up in Idaho. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't make them any less black. That doesn't mean they have a different experience than we did. That's right. So the question is, can we name three things that 95% of us all agree on? Probably not. Well, it's okay, but let's just, let's see. Okay. Let's ask, let's not just say probably not. Okay. Maybe there are. Okay. Maybe there are just three really simple things. Okay. Right? And maybe there's only two. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. Let's find those two. Yeah, And let's all 95% of us work Work for those two things. That's exactly Mm -hmm. right. And if we actually get the two things that we all agree on, that's an incredible act of power. You're right. And once you do that, you go, I have power. Mm-hmm. Right? Then you realize the superhero in you. Mm. And right. then you go, well, what else can we do? And then you do that. That's right. And that's enough. It doesn't have, you know, okay. I mean, look, I put together like a 10 point program mm-hmm. just because I grew up admiring the Black Panther 10 point program. Mm-hmm. Now, my 10 points may not be the same as your 10 point. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. I just made a list because I didn't see anybody else making a list. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think everybody should make a list, you know, and let's all figure out how we can do it. Yeah. And that movement, I mean, it really, uh, w- what stunned me about it, because I had never, I mean, I really cover black stuff pretty mm-hmm. closely, um, you know, political, cultural, otherwise. Mm-hmm. And I had never heard of them before Kamala Harris decided to run for president. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden they're like, well, this person's not really black. Mm-hmm. And uh, we and black people as a whole should not vote for Democrats. They didn't yeah. say didn't vote for Republicans. Yeah. They only they only are targeting Democrats in their in their thing. That's right. So I was like, oh, I see. So the party that we have the closest alliance with, the party who's most likely to give us things we want right. are the people you want us to and, break ties with. And you're mm-hmm. saying that you're a single issue voter because you're saying reparations is right. the issue. And you have a party that's saying, we're trying to find a way to get to reparations. You got, right. you know, you got uh uh Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, the people who the main targets are ADOS, right. signing this bill, the HR 40 bill, right. that ADOS supported on their website. Mm-hmm. On their website, it said, in our demands, HR 40 must be passed. Mm-hmm. Well, then Cory Booker said, okay, let's work to get HR 40 passed. And as mm-hmm. soon as he did that, ADOS changed the language on their website mm-hmm. yes. and said, we don't, we don't mess with HR 40 no more. Right, because the goal is to stop black people from voting. Mm-hmm. For, yeah. Again, you know when people say... The devil's great greatest trick is to teach is to make you think he doesn't exist. That's right. Mm-hmm. Their greatest trick is to trick black people into thinking their vote ain't worth nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But let me tell you something. I know rich people and I know wealthy people. Mm-hmm. Here's something what all wealthy people I know do. Vote. Every single one of them. So why do all these really wealthy people vote? Because they understand the power of voting. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, well, if y'all trying to do what wealthy people do, you're trying to wear their outfits and drive their cars and live in their neighborhood. Yeah. Well, you need to be voting too exactly. because that's what wealthy people do. That's what truly powerful people in this country, in this world do. Yeah. They vote. Now, if you don't want power, if you just want, if you committed to victimhood, then be a victim. Mm-hmm. But guess what? I don't respect you because mm-hmm. you're weak. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, I know those people, they're not moved by the whole we, you know, that our ancestors died for this right and all mm-hmm. that. They're like, whatever, it's all the same thing. No, it's not. Mm-hmm. See, I understand some of that because I used to be there. 
I think that's sure. why I'm more sensitive to to that to the mm-hmm. and maybe why I'm targeted by them because I'm someone who has publicly I've never suggested that someone else don't vote. Mm-hmm. I've just said I don't I, I I don't see the the point of it. I don't like the electoral college. I don't like money in politics. Mm-hmm. Um, as I grew older. Um, it became worth it to me to study more. Um, I started reading more about Malcolm and 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 people like the Adas community, community. They try to own someone like Malcolm, but they hate immigrants. His mother is an immigrant from right. from from Gr- Grenada. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, they hate Pan Africanists. Mm-hmm. Malcolm X is one of the greatest examples. Marcus of, Garvey, yeah, greatest examples of Pan Africanism ever. But um, Malcolm got together with Adam Clayton Powell, mm-hmm. someone he didn't see eye to eye with politically on on everything but got together with him and they, they got the community to start thinking about issues that they could all agree on right. and vote as a block. Yes. And, and I understood from the lens of Malcolm how, how and why voting is, is powerful. And so I try to use my voice. I, 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 I'm careful not, and I don't think, I'm not accusing you of this, mm-hmm. but I'm careful not to shame anybody who doesn't vote because I was there before, I understand it. Mm-hmm. But when I see something like what's happened with ADOS, I mm-hmm. understand even more clear how important it is to get people to understand who is trying to suppress your vote, right. who is trying to stop you from voting, and how and who benefits from that. Right. And people go, well, why do I got to choose between the lesser of two evils? You do every day. Mm. Are you going to eat oatmeal or bacon for breakfast? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I well, pick one. Mm-hmm. That's the lesser of those two evils. Mm-hmm. And guess what? When you say, well, I don't like what the Democratic Party does. I don't like what the Republican Party does. Okay, but one's the flu and one's cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you got to pick between flu and cancer, do you not care? Or will you make a choice? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just that, I mean, like, you know, don't be so simple about it. Mm-hmm. You know, yes, yes. Grown-ups have to make adult choices, mm-hmm. right? And not every choice is to your liking, but not making a choice means you give your power to other people. Yeah, and a lot of time, and, and people, not just ADOS, but people who make that argument, Yes, they say that, you know, voting is supposed to be exchanged, so why would I give away my vote to a party that takes my... There's valid arguments to be made. Yeah. Valid criticism of the De- Democratic Party, taking black people votes for granted, right? Of course! So they'd be like, why would I give my vote to that? But it's like, then then what are you talking about a vote is exchanged? Because you're not exchanging nothing. You're not showing up to the table with nothing. If you're withholding your vote, you are you in that space... You were powerless. Now, if you're someone, there are activists I know that don't vote. I don't get on them because I see them doing activist work in the activist space. If you're someone who's like, I just can't be choose between this person and that person. I just, I just, my heart of hearts and my morals won't let me vote for no matter how, no matter how evil this other person is. I just can't. Then, God damn it, you better be showing me some real activist work. I don't agree with that because as an activist, you're a, a main example. Like people are looking at you. So if you're not voting, they're going to. Well, do I don't. The same I think thing. it's dangerous to say that a vote automatically makes you an activist. No, and I'm voting saying- make, is activism work. It's not. I think you can do activism work without being a voter. Now, I'm someone who, and as I get older, I think we should be voters. But I've, I've, uh, most of my life, been in communities of activists, many of them who do not vote, but do, but still do incredible activist work. But, but, but here's the thing. Mm-hmm. I, again, I just go, okay, but how do we get power, mm-hmm. right? And the white evangelical vote mm-hmm. has a disproportion, even though they're a small group of people mm-hmm. in terms of actual numbers, mm-hmm. they have a disproportionate amount of power That's right. Right among politicians of either side because they always vote in yeah, every election. It's strategic. You can count on them. And even now, for the first time in this campaign, the party, the Democrats and Republicans, are slowly acknowledging that black people are the backbone of the Democratic Party. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right? So here's the thing. When people go, well, I'm not getting anything for it, that's because you think your job is on one day, which mm. is voting. Yeah. Okay? Voting is the, day the after. start yeah. of the job. Mm-hmm. If you want stuff, then you need to literally ask for it. Meaning, literally call mm-hmm. a politician, write a letter, go to, the meetings. go to their meetings, and say, I want this. I demand this. Mm-hmm. Right? It's a relationship. Yeah. Uh, at the Revolt Summit, that's what pretty much Angela Rye was talking about because, number one, she was discouraging, don't just vote on for the president. You have to vote for everything. And you do have to get up and go out and do something. And in Atlanta, what Stacey 
Stacey Abrams, that shows how much power we have because that race was so close and black people literally had to get out and vote in order for her to win. What the Republicans have done, which is quite brilliant, right, is <clears throat> they have a bunch of policies that are very unpopular, right, that 90% of Americans disagree with them on. But they ran for every little office. They ran for dog mm -hmm. catcher. Yeah. They ran for head of the library. Mm -hmm. They ran for anything that you could vote for. Mm -hmm. And as they took all of those small offices in, in, in counties and towns mm -hmm. all over the country, they were able to an advance an agenda mm -hmm. that most people, I'm talking about Republicans, yeah. disagreed with. Yeah. And they make themselves, you know, like the, like a puffer fish, right? They make themselves feel like, well, we're the majority of Americans. You're not. Yeah. You are you are as small a minority as Black people are, mm -hmm. right? Most Americans don't believe what you're saying. That's right. But you have you have gained the system into taking control. We can do the same thing. We, the small minority, that is us. Mm -hmm right, can take control of the system in ways that we can't imagine. And again, this is one of the biggest things I learned from making Django, right? The first half of the movie we were shooting was a cowboy movie, right? Yeah. Riding horses and right. shootouts, and it was fun. Then we left California and we went down to Louisiana and we're shooting on plantations and the mood changed because mm -hmm. you should, I mean, it's depressing, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, here is a tree where they lynch people. Yeah. Here is, here's the cabin where you slept on the ground. Here's mm -hmm. all this terrible stuff. And, you know, so we had all these uh, uh, actors who work out in the fields. So one of the actors came to me on the second week of us shooting out there. And he goes, Hey, I want to introduce myself. I'm one of the background actors, but I'm also a minister. Oh, wow. And working on this set last week gave me my greatest sermon. Mm. I said, wow, what was it? He says, you know, I'm out here working and it's hot. And if I get too hot, I can sit down. I can raise my hand. Somebody will run over and give me mm -hmm. a bottle of water. And it was a hundred times easier than being an actual slave, but it was really hard. Right. And I thought, okay, people were slaves experiencing that, but a, a, a million times worse. Mm -hmm. And these people had the faith to think that it would change. Mm. And here we are on this movie set, black, white, Native American, Asian, Latin, working to make a movie about a black man who destroys all this. And here we are as living proof of their faith mm. of something that was unimaginable. Mm. And that's the true meaning of faith. So... When people say, man, we can't, I'm like, mm -hmm. stop. Yeah. Right. What are you talking about? We've already done the hardest part. Yeah. We're free. We were slaves. They would, we went from, if you read, they will kill you. And less than 50 years, we had built Black Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And when they bombed us, you know what we did? We built it back. Mm -hmm. We can do anything. Yeah. Stop being a punk. Stop being a punk. Yeah. Black excellence, stop being a punk. Ladies and gentlemen, wow. Reginald Hudlin, the people's party. Freaking amazing. I was about to shed a tear, but that's not amazing. <laughs>